All right, few other terms that we want to cover. Uh, risk capacity, risk appetite. We've already talked about risk tolerance. And then a term called risk utility. All right, risk capacity. Every organization has a certain amount of loss that they can just absorb, right? How much loss can we suffer and just still keep on ticking? And then there's a point beyond that at which our very existence, our very function is going to be threatened. So ultimately, that's our risk capacity. How much risk can we absorb and still keep moving? And it's often surprising, you know, if you look at the credit card industry, for instance, how much money is lost in the credit card industry due to identity theft and fraud, you know, basically just credit card fraud. They lose over a billion dollars. That is a lot of money. How's Visa and MasterCard, how are they still doing? Are they uh, a dying breed? No, they're still going along thriving they can absorb a tremendous amount of loss. And as a matter of fact, they could lose less money. Would you agree with that? The credit card companies could implement more controls so that identity theft is regulated and, you know, they could implement controls and see a drastic reduction in identity theft and a drastic reduction in loss. Can anybody think of why they might not, why they don't do it? So I have the potential to lose less money. I can implement security controls and lose less money. Why wouldn't I do that? Well, because if the cost of the control doesn't have a positive return on investment, why would I? So meaning if it costs me too much to prevent that loss, if it costs me $50 to save 20, it doesn't make sense. So the credit card industry right now says, yeah, we could lessen this loss, but to do so would cost us more money than it's worth to us. So they continue to absorb the loss. Okay, it also doesn't hurt that the credit card industry is self-regulated currently with, uh, you know, they have the payment card industry's data security standard. And so they're setting their risk capacity. And as long as they're still financially viable, um, they're really saying, well, you know, as long as that loss happens and it doesn't exceed our risk capacity, we're good. Okay, so that goes with their risk appetite and their risk tolerance as well. Now, also, we want to know the term risk utility. And the idea is nobody undertakes risks without some idea that they have a chance of gain, right? I don't go to Vegas and just turn over $500 and walk out of the room, although I probably should. It just at least save me the night. But man, I go to Vegas and I think, there's that chance, right? There's that one, it's a small chance, but maybe this is the night that I win it all, take on that massive jackpot, right? That's the risk utility. So the idea is I am willing to put more out there if the risk utility is higher, right? It's the potential for gain. And usually what we have to weigh is the potential for loss versus the potential for gain, and then we have to think about probability and impact, right? That's where we have to think about those unknowns as being positive and negative. I've got to look at, yeah, I could lose 500 bucks, but I could also gain 5 million. But then we also have to think about probability as well. And that's where that 5 million versus 500 bucks, you know, doesn't quite weigh out. So risk utility is the reason we undertake risk. We've got something to gain. All right. Now, when we're working within an organization and our specialty is risk management, so we said risk management's that umbrella term, right? We've got coordinated activities and what we're looking to do is to manage and control or direct and control risk within the enterprise and ultimately our goal is to bring residual risk down to an acceptable level. And that's a phrase that just comes up over and over on this exam, comes up over and over in the class. We're going to reduce residual risk to a level that's acceptable by senior management. All right. So one of the first things that we have to do as part of risk management is understand the context of the organization. And one of the things that's really universal for ISACA courses and exams 
and ISC courses and exams. It's all about the business. You can't focus on security. You can't look at risks. You can't look at controls until you look at the business. So the first step is always step back and understand the business. What is the context in which the business operates, in which the business works? So for any of you that have worked in, uh, that have been a part of the military, that's a very specific context. The military has its own culture. The military has its own standards. The military has its own environment. They have their own rules and regulations. They have their own assets. And usually speaking, when we're talking about assets that the military protects, we're looking at assets of very high national import, right? So that's a very important context to understand before I go in and start trying to write policy. Whereas the risk context of a grocery store versus a dentist's office versus you know, a multi-million dollar toy store, whatever. I have to understand what is the context in which the business operates. So once I understand what the business is, what our business objectives are, now I can kind of step back and I can shape that in the context of risk. And with risks, what are our assets? What are the threats and vulnerabilities? And again, the value of our assets also is going to impact what threats are out there. High value assets, there are a whole lot more threats than for things that are low value. The more valuable the assets are, not just the more threats, but often the more sophisticated the threats and the threat actors are. That's part of understanding the context of the organization. Okay. Um, we have to think about the consistency of these risks. Do risks vary based on the political climate? For instance, I think I mentioned I worked at the State Department, and it didn't even have to be a, politi a, a, a presidential election. But as politics changed, as public opinion changed, as new laws came about, and certainly in the event of a political election where parties switch hands, you would see that many of the ways that we did business, so to speak, would change when the politics of the governing bodies would change. That's the same within an organization. You know, an organization that has CI, uh, has a CISO get replaced with someone else, you'll see a different shift in philosophy. So what sort of, what's the consistency of the environment? Um, are we impacted by new competition? Is there, you know, are our risks based on geography? Uh, what is the, you know, what are the personnel risks? So ultimately, again, we're really looking at the organization. And based on our organization, we're able to define and to understand a context for our risks.